good. We're, we're talking about finally a way out. And um, kind of as an introduction, so to speak, I want us to understand that How do I put this? What, the, what we do in here is not a worldly activity because what the world seems to do is give us information. We all, we, the world is about informing other people. We just want them to know. Oh, what's that catchphrase I use? It's, losing, it's escaping me right now. We just want people to know. Um, you know, I forget what the buzzword was. But people think it's the information that brings change in their life, and it's not. There's a lot of stupid people that know a lot of stuff. And they live pretty stupid. But they're not ignorant folk. They know, but they think if I just get information, then I'm good. Now, some of the information we need is just to stop getting more information and do the information that we already have because God is about revelational knowledge that will bring change in our life. So that's what we're talking about in this process as we're going through how the enemy can attack us, tend to attack us, get in us. As Paul said here, look at he said, who's going to rescue this miserable man? I'm a miserable guy. I'm having issues here. I'm miserable. And I have an unwelcomed intruder of sin and death. But I give thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out. That's the goal, to get out of the situation. Not continue to talk about it. Not to continue to gather more information about it. But to get freed from it. <clears throat> because I'm going to talk a little bit more here in, in, in a minute that... People tend to get just good at managing things. We think when we manage a problem, we're all set. And know what they say? Well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. No, but you're still bad. You're just less bad. So what's your point? You were like really bad. Now you're kind of bad. Now you're just bad. I mean, why don't you just get freed from the thing? But see, that's the way the world tends to function. Well, it ain't that bad. Yeah, it is bad. You know, it's like I've shared before. How much poison do you want in your Thanksgiving dinner? Well, I'm going to put a little arsenic in the turkey. It ain't bad. It won't kill you. Why? Why, why have we settled to think that it's okay to have a little bad, be a little bad, be a little whatever, and not come to that place of being completely free. Because that's what we want to become, hopefully, is get to that place where it no longer dogs us at all. And Paul starts out by saying, look, I'm a miserable guy. And see, what we've done is convinced ourselves that, oh, I'm not as bad as I used to be. You've taken, I'm the miserable guy out of the equation. Whatever you tolerate and put up with will allow you to tolerate and put up with. Devils will let you tolerate them and put up with them instead of getting completely freed from them. So next slide, if you would. We've talked about kind of the stages of demonization. You know, infestation, oppression, obsession, and then possession part. Well, I can't be possessed. Yeah, you've gotten out of control. That's what I'm talking about. In fact, some of you are getting out of control, and once you came back into control, it wigged you out that you got that out of control. So next slide, if you would. So we're talking about the symptoms, and I'm not going to re-preach all these. You can go back and watch them. They're all on YouTube. Area of sleep. Devil plagues us in the area of sleep. Demons, whatever, whatever term you want to use. Unwelcomed intruder, if those other two words are a little too offensive, doesn't, doesn't matter. We just got to be honest and real with the situation. But nightmares. How many weeks ago did I talk about this? I forget now, three weeks now. If you're still having nightmares, that means you've not applied any principles to get rid of the nightmares. You tolerate them. 
That's my point in when I was at the beginning. Why are you tolerating them? God said he's given us sweet sleep. Why are you tolerating people chasing you in your dreams? Why are you tolerating people trying to kill you in your dreams? Why are you tolerating fighting in your dreams? And all these other things that we said. Why? Yeah, but I'm not, they're not as bad as they used to be. Why do you believe in that lie? Man, that keeps hitting me. That's for somebody. Because I can't shake that thing. You are tolerating things, believing the lie, just because it's not as bad as it used to be. You're okay now. That's a lie. You're not okay. You're just not as bad as you used to be. Notice the word bad is still in the sentence. You're not free. You're not using the word freedom in the sentence. Next slide, if you would. Mental oppression. Now, remember I was telling you things come in clusters when we deal with them? All these things can occur at the same time, but mental oppression, you're still having intrusive thoughts, tormenting thoughts, condemning thoughts, blasphemous thoughts, suicidal thoughts, fear-filled thoughts. Well, yeah, I'm still afraid. Why? I talked about this two weeks ago, we'll just say. Probably three weeks ago, because Jeff was in there somewhere. Why? Why are you still afraid? Why are you still afraid of stuff? Now, I'm not just talking in the spiritual sense. I'm talking in the natural sense, too. Okay, they're saying this new variant is showing up. Why are you afraid? I heard a conversation yesterday of someone who was very afraid about a new variant of a virus. Why are you afraid? Why? It's not an either or. It's can, the thing can be real, but you don't got to be afraid of it. There's a real possibility I could drive home today and get in an accident. Not really, because I don't believe that, but I'm just an example. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm not going to drive home after church, because I'm afraid. Hey, brother, bless you. Thanks for the air conditioner. There he is, getting in his car. Be blessed. So again, if... if God didn't give us a spirit of fear, and I'm afraid about something, then why don't you get rid of that? Yeah, but I'm not as bad as I used to be. Yeah, you're still afraid. Because we're talking about freedom, not coping. The world wants you to cope. God wants you free. See, the Son came to set us free. See, if we never get to the place of freedom, ooh, Lord, that's hard. So give. It's like treading on the blood of Jesus that paid for your freedom. The blood of Jesus came to set you free. And if you're making excuses as to why you can't be free, or you're not as bad as you used to, or whatever phraseology you want to use, you're literally treading the blood of Jesus under your foot and calling of none effect. That's not a good thing. Now, I'm not saying you're doing it purposefully or whatever. I'm just saying we need to reframe our thinking and understand Christ came to set us free, not to be not as bad as we used to be, not to tolerate things, but to live in absolute and complete freedom and not have any mental oppression or torment anymore. Next one, if you would. Emotional oppression that we talked about. Anger and frustration and anxiety and disappointment and, and the list there, loneliness. These highs and lows. I mean, you can be having a great day, somebody say something to you, and you go to the lowest lows. That's not you. That's an unwelcome intruder. Yeah, but I'm not as bad as I used to be. Yeah, because you pop a pill every day for it. God didn't design you to pop a pill for it every day. He designed you to be free. Now, if you need that as an immediate step, I'm not going to tell you what to do, how to do, but the goal is, this is what he's just really impressed upon me, the goal is to get to the place of absolute freedom, and it doesn't take decades to get there. It doesn't even take weeks. It may take a week. It may take 30 days, because a lot of what these are, in the next section I'm going to get to, why don't you just throw it up there? Next slide, if you would. It takes time to break a habit. There are physical habits involved in some of this, and it usually takes 30 days to break a habit. 
But if you set a goal and after one month you should be free, because it's going to take time for your body to, to rid itself of that stuff if it's something you're taking. But the other way the enemy messes with us, attacks us, tries to keep us in bondage, whatever works for you to get your understanding to where it needs to be is this, in the areas of our desires. What do I mean? Intense desires are cravings for defiled things. People crave and def desire defiled things, what the Bible calls defiled. And I had to add the word up there, electronics. I've never seen a generation now so enslaved to these things that if they leave the house and forget their phone somewhere, it like wipes them out all day. I'm old enough to remember when there weren't no phones. I'm old enough to remember the only phone you had was on the wall in the kitchen. And it had a little dial on it, didn't even have buttons. And you were really uppity when you got that long cord that it would actually stretch over to the sink. So you could do the dishes and actually talk on the phone. People wig out about those things. And if they don't get the latest and greatest games and all that stuff, they're like, so addicted and controlled. We already know scientifically that this screen messes with our heads. That's why they tell you, put this thing down at least an hour before you go to bed because the blue light affects your serotonin, if I'm saying that right, a melatonin uh, production. That's why they say shut off everything, the TV and everything before you go to bed for at least an hour. These things are known scientifically, but yet it's like, yeah, but I'm not as bad as I used to be. So, what do I mean by defiled things? Well, I should say, what's the Bible say? They're the things in the Bible that the Bible calls defiled. They're the things that are unholy, the things that are ungodly, the things that are vile and perverted, things that are forbidden and immoral. They are things like narcotics and alcohol and nicotine and gambling, strange addictions, pornography. And see, before we get into a list, that's what people want. They want a list. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. You know where your list is? Right here. Later on today, open it up and read it. Don't ask me. You read it. See, it says Holy Bible. No defilement. He'll let you know what the defilements are. That's where the list is. So what are we talking about? A strong craving or a deep desire for those things that the Spirit of God is telling you not to do. See, and people balk at the legalism part. And they should. We shouldn't be legalistic about anything. Because people want a list of do's and don'ts. I don't know why people... Well, I do know why. So I shouldn't say it that way. How have we become so lazy as a people that we won't just do our own research and find out for ourselves? Why are we always asking the other person what to do as if the other person knows better what to do for us than we do? Are we with God in our relationship that way? Why do we do that? Part of it, we're too lazy to open the book ourselves and find out. I get that. But we do that with all kinds of segments of society. Well, I'm going to go to this guy for this advice, that guy for that advice. We kind of did some of that a little bit. You know, we were on a conference call Friday night with someone talking about something in an area I don't know, and I purposefully asked the person, well, what would you do if you were in our shoes? And the person told me, gave me the answer. But that doesn't mean I'm going to do it just because they would do it. That means now that I know, I can take that to God and pray about it and see if it's the right thing for me to do. That's what I'm talking about. Where do we get to the place where we're so um, 
I don't want to use the word lazy. That's kind of strong. But you know what I mean. We don't go to the place of getting the information, which I did in that case, but then taking the information and taking it to God and saying, God, is this the way this ought to go? We don't do that. And then what we do on the other side of the coin is, if that did not work out the way the person told us to, it should, we go to the other person and blame them like it was their fault. That's why I say, don't ask me nothing no more. I ain't telling you. But what would you do? I'll tell you what I would have done or what I have done. I ain't telling you to do the same. You take it and take it to God. Stop being lazy that way. Do you know that there are people in this world that do not have your best interest at heart? They don't give a flip about you. They don't care. There's always going to be 10% of the population, 10% of the people you know that are going to love you no matter what and think you walk on water. And there's going to be 10% of the population that's going to hate you and wish you drowned instead of walking on that water. No matter what you do or say, it doesn't matter. And then you get the 80% in the middle. So you've got to figure it out for yourself and stop trying to please everyone else and seek to please God. In order to do that, this is a relationship thing. See, our return on investment, he was showing me this this morning, our return on investment isn't a reward from God, it's a relationship. That's huge, guys, get that. Note the word, world programs us for a reward. You do this, I'll give you this. You put in 40 hours in this little block building and I'll give you this amount of money. So then we go to God with the same thing. Well, God, I prayed, I want this answer. Well, God, I have this need and I ask you for it, I want this reward. I did what you said, God. I went to church and I put money in the plate, but I still don't have any money at the end of the week to put in my car for gas, God. I did what you said, so where's my reward? It's not a reward, it's a relationship. That's why faith doesn't work for a lot of people. They're looking for a reward-based relationship, and it's not. It's an intimacy thing. And he provides. And he takes care of you, because he's never going to leave you or forsake you. Our relationship isn't need-driven, it's faith-driven. It's based in faith. And we've got to understand there's not a one-size-fits-all for everybody. That's where legalism falls in. You do this and you don't do that. You know, you've got to come into church and carry a certain kind of Bible and look a certain kind of way and talk a certain talk. And no. That's where people balk at that. That's where I balk at that. You do not know what's best for me. You may think you do. You may give me some input and I will take your suggestions, but that's where it ends. But see, when it comes to these defiled things, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to show us what the true defilement is. And let me give you a hint. It's usually the thing you're fighting with, with him over, that he's telling you to quit doing. Because there's some things you can do that I can't, and vice versa. And we'll bring that up a little bit more in a minute here. But these intense desires, intense cravings, what am I talking about when I, when I use that term? They're commonly called addictions. We know that term in society, addictions. Basically, they're the things that got a hook in you, so to speak. That where you're no longer control, you are no longer in control over the issue or the behavior. It controls you. It's something that when you try to stop doing, you can't completely break free from it. What you do is get good at managing it. Again, well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. Yeah, but you're still not free because it still has a hook in you. And what's concerning is people fight with you and they get upset and try to justify that kind of behavior or that kind of issue which is concerning. 
Because I think we've got to understand the Holy Spirit guides us in all truth on how to walk out our life on a daily. We think, oh, the Holy Spirit just guides me in spiritual matters. No, he guides you on every matter. Everything. It has nothing to do with any, you know, just spiritual stuff. No. What you should do throughout the day. So let's talk about this defilement again a little bit. Let's bring a little clarity. I remember last year, I think at this time, or a little over a year now, I actually went through a thing about defilement. You can look those videos up if you want to check them out again. But there's a term I use. I use general defilement and specific defilement. And general defilement speaks of this. They're activities that are clearly stated in the Word of God as being wicked or defiled behavior. These are activities that are not up for debate. No, it can be swept away with some decry legalism. No, God clearly says it. You know, what God calls wicked and defiled behavior is just that, case closed. If you, and again, if you want to know what they are, look in the book, read it. No, guess what? Sex between same couples, no, defiled. It's in the book. It's not my opinion, it's in the book. No, two sexes, it's in the book. No, anything past that's defilement and perversion. Well, that's your opinion. No, it's in the book. That's what I'm saying. No debate, no question. It's in the book. God says what he means, and he means what he says. So that's general defilement, general wickedness, general perversion. It's in the book. But then there's specific defilement. As I said earlier, and that's behavior activity that may not be in that list of general defilement, but these are specific activities that you need to stay away from because they're traps designed by the enemy to put you back into bondage or keep you in bondage or get you to the place where you're just managing something and saying, I'm not as bad as I used to be. The devil knows how to personally mess you up. He's been watching you for a long time and he knows your generational history. That's why we need to seek God's guidance and wisdom to avoid those things that will cause us to fall into those pitfalls. See, Romans 8.15 says this. You see, you have not received a spirit that returns you to slavery. You've not received a spirit that's going to bring you back into the thing God's trying to set you free from. So you have nothing to fear. The spirit you have received adopted you and welcomed you into God's own family. That is why we call him Abba Father as we would address a loving dad. You've got to understand, and I'm going to, I'll allude to this a little bit further, but when you get set free from something, guess what? The enemy's going to try to get back in that same place. He wants to keep you in bondage. I don't think he really cares to what degree, because if you are controlled by anything else other than the Holy Spirit, you are addicted. You are being controlled. You are not in control. You may not be as bad as you used to be, but you are not in control. See, addictive behavior usually has a trigger mechanism attached to it. Always has a trigger mechanism. So when I used to drink, I just use that example, it was usually triggered by a bad day. Had a bad day, I'm all wound up, now I gotta go home and just relax, get a, get a beer, sit down, and one went to two, and two went to three, and it just kept going. But I got to relax. That was my trigger mechanism. And guess what? The devil would make sure I had a lot of bad days. And what ended up happening was I got a spirit of drunkenness. So that spirit of drunkenness now wanted to manifest itself and feed its appetite for that. Because the spirit of drunkenness can't manifest itself outside of drunk. So it would make sure I had a bad day. And then when the weekend showed up, well, I love sports, so I would sit down and watch sports. And what do you do when you're sitting down watching sports? You drink beer. How do I know? Every commercial at the, while I'm watching sports showed people in a bar watching the football game and drinking beer. 
So that's what you did. Trigger mechanism. That's what happens. The devil knows how to mess with your head, mess with your heart, influence your flesh to get you hooked. Or whatever the addiction is, doesn't matter. But catch this next part. What I've learned over the years when dealing with demons is this. If you are willing to admit your struggles and not hide from them, you will diffuse the demon's power over you along with the fear of being exposed. Now, how many times I was told I drank too much? I said, oh, no, I don't drink too much. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. <laughs> you want to see someone drinks too much? Look at so-and-so. They drink too much, not me. Exactly. You could always find someone worse than you, couldn't you? I ain't that bad. I got a handle on this watch. I'll quit for three days. I got a handle on it. I remember my biggie was 28 days. Then I screwed up, drove all the way to Massachusetts, forgot her shoes at home, told Mary, oh, I'll drive back, no big deal. Then it hit me. Oh, why don't you get a six-pack? And by the time I got back to Massachusetts, I was drunk. Because he knows how to trigger you. He knows how to get you. I didn't hit that 30-day mark yet. It was only 28. But see, when you admit to yourself that you have an issue, yeah, I got a problem. Forget that I ain't as bad as I used to be stuff. Forget that, well, there's someone else always worse than me stuff. If you do like Paul did, remember what Paul said. Man, I'm a miserable guy. When you get to that place, you break the power over the enemy, not only for that, but being exposed. So I didn't want people to find out. I didn't want Mary to find out. 28 days, I had gone. She thought, oh, maybe this is it. It was interesting trying to hide that when I got back. Didn't work out well, especially when I went to the fridge and got a beer. <laughs> Thought you quit. Yeah, we're 28 days. That's good. I ain't got a problem. But see, when you admit it and you rat yourself out and admit you have the problem, then the demon's power of exposure is gone. So that's what a lot of people don't want to do. They don't want to rat themselves out. So I put down here that the demon's power in exposing you is usually through gossip. Do you know what so-and-so did? Do you know what so-and-so did? Gossip's a tool of the devil. See, people always want to put a front that's a false front that's not them and hide their exposure to things. But if you rat yourself out, then you break the power of the enemy on that. Yeah, I did that. Yep. Sorry, what do you want me to say? Well, I thought you were better than that. Sorry. That's what we see in society today. Everybody's wigging out about stuff. Why? They're going to be exposed for what they really are and who they really are. Because people are not what they put up as a front. They're not anywhere near that. And I don't know why Christian people are the same way when they come in. Everybody's put this front down like, like you're all set. No. Maybe that's why we got to sing that Matthew West song again sometime soon. No. But see, I love what Paul said. Because remember what Paul said? He said, follow my example. Paul said, look at me. Here in Romans 7, he's saying, I'm a miserable guy. How am I going to get set free from all this? But then Paul also said, follow me. Look at me as an example. Why? What was he saying? He's saying, look at me. <clears throat> he says, hello, been there, done that, beat that. Jesus delivered me. The devil's a liar. And now he calls it a testimony. Now he has a testimony. So testify. Yeah, I was a drunk. Yeah, I drank bad. But guess what? I am set free. I don't manage it. I'm freed from it. Ain't got no hook in me no more. 
And I don't care what the thing is. That was just my thing. That's what I'm sharing and testifying to. So I don't manage it. I'm freed from it. See, Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him. Whatever him you got in there, whatever unwelcomed intruder you got, put his name there. They overcame him. How? By the blood of the lamb. This power in the blood. Stop treading on the blood. Stop, stop verbalizing your inadequacies to deal with the situation yourself. Guess what? We know that. You cannot free yourself. If you could, Jesus never had to come and shed his blood for you. If you could go to heaven on your own, Jesus never had to come and shed his blood for you. If you could do anything on your own, Jesus wasted his time showing up. No, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Thank him for the blood. Thank him for the power in the blood. Thank him that he came and he did not quit and he didn't manage the issue and he went all the way and shed his blood for you. And don't tread it underfoot by making foolish excuses why you can't be set free. Because here's the freedom verse. They overcame him, how? By the blood of the Lamb. And not only that, by the word of their testimony. No, I will testify of the goodness of God all the days of my life. I will testify of what he's done for me. I don't know why we always focus on the negative. Well, I do know why, because we're more naturally minded than heavenly minded. No, my God is going to take care of all my needs. But, there are no buts, get your butt out of the way. Except the one in Romans, Galish sent me the other, the other day. That's the only good but in the scripture. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the wages of sin is death. But, that's a good but. The gift of God is eternal life. Get rid of all the other buts. Yeah, but you don't know. Please, don't use that word on me, because it doesn't know. I may get nasty with you, because all you're trying to do is make me feel guilty, make me think you got something I can't relate to, and no. That's why I really hate when people pull the death card. Sorry, been there. Yeah, but my friend died of COVID. Yeah, well, my wife died too. Now what are we going to do? The death of your friend, okay, feel bad for you, but guess what? Been there, done that, I got a testimony. You can get through, you can get past, you don't have to live in fear, you don't have to live in doubt, you don't have to live in anything. You can be free, because that's what the blood did. And the testimony does and did not love their life even unto death because when people say stuff like that, they're like, oh, look at me, look at how bad I am, look at how much trouble I'm in. As my wife likes to say, suck it up, buttercup. Suck it up. That's getting nowhere. See, and I'm talking about people in the church. People in the church. We're going to all give an account of ourselves to God. We will kneel down before Him and give an account. And you're going to try to pull this stuff and it ain't going to work. I'm just trying to give you a warning, please. If you don't get past it now, oh, because then you may hear, I never knew you depart from me. You don't want to hear that because there ain't no coming back. So again, they overcame, how? By the blood. By the word of their testimony, not be moaning and justifying their inadequacies or their place that they're in. And they did not love their life even unto death. That's why I can wrap myself out. I don't care. I'm going to wrap myself out before you can wrap me out. Don't care. Why? I'm dead. I don't need to impress anybody. There's only one I need to impress. His name's Jesus. And I understand the way to break free from this is, yeah, I'm a miserable man. In myself, I'm a miserable person, and I have no power and strength to overcome anything. But I'm not in me. I'm in him. 
And by His blood, and by His grace, and His mercy, I can overcome anything. So please do not ever say to me, but you don't understand. Because really, you don't understand. Because you don't understand what Jesus did for you. And you're treading on his blood under your feet. And that's a dangerous place to be. So again, we need to remember in this area of defilement that demons feed on defilement and wickedness in order to manifest and gratify their obsession. They will torment your mind, your emotions, your flesh in order to get you to submit so that they may fill their diet and their obsession. So please get this revelation. It is the unwelcomed intruder that's tormenting you. It's not you. Especially if you're always feeling guilty and upset and ashamed of falling into that behavior again. It's not you. You already know you don't want to do that. Now, if you're gleefully participating in it, that's another issue. But if you do it and you're like, man, it got me again. Wow, I can't believe this. Wow. And you, and you just keep crying out to God. It's not you. See, you've allowed this intruder in your life by participating in the defiled behavior, and now you're hooked. Nobody ever starts out wanting to be an addict. <laughs> First beer I ever drank, I didn't expect to become a drunk. First time I ever got high on pot, didn't expect to get hooked on that. Nobody does. So a lot of things we do out of ignorance, we do out of prodding from peers, we do out of whatever gets us started, but the enemy knows that. But we got to be honest with ourselves when we get to that place that, you know what, this has me more than I got it. That's why Paul described himself as a miserable man. He says, I'm in an agonizing situation. See, freedom is initiated when we admit that we're being tormented by an unwelcomed intruder. I don't know why Christians want to fight about that issue. Well, I can't have a demon. Yeah, you got one. It's talking to me right now. Demons don't like to be exposed. Demons kick up a fuss. Demons act crazy and insane because they can only function when stayed hidden. Why do you think I used to get violently upset with people when they would say, you drink too much? No, I don't. That demon wanted to stay hidden. Didn't want to be exposed. See, because we've got to understand this getting rid of these unwelcomed intruders is part of SOZO. It's part of our salvation package. It's part of the benefit package. So instead of running from it, we need to run to it. We need to run to Jesus, not away from him. Say, Lord, I'm a miserable person. I'm in an agonizing situation. I need your help. I know we can break through this. I know this power in the blood. I know this power in the testimony. I know I need to die to self in this area. I don't know why I'm so concerned what other people think about me, Lord, or how I look before other people. I don't know why. Can you break this thing? Give me revelation. Whatever you need to get to the place where you get to the place, you really don't care. Because they're not your Lord. They didn't die for you. Again, I'm talking getting to that place where you literally live your life for other people. So in order to gain complete freedom, we've got to stop supplying the demon with defilement that it feeds on. Cut off its food supply. Then we must evict the unwelcomed intruder, kick it out of the house, and lock the door behind us. That's how you get rid of it, guys. It's clearly stated in Matthew 12, 43 and 45. This out of the Passion Translation says this. When a demon is cast out of a person. So that means a person can have one. He didn't say a lost person. He didn't say a non-Christian Christian. A person. Are you a people? You can have one. When a demon is cast out of a person. Cast out. That means expelled. I forget the Greek word, ekbalo or something. It means to violently throw out. Not ask, not suggest, 
give them the size 12 on the way out the door, violently, expel. It says it roams around in a dry region looking for a place to rest, but never finds it. Why? It can't manifest out in a place that it doesn't have a host to manifest through. It's a spirit. For a spirit to manifest, it needs a body. Hey, that'll preach just like the Holy Spirit can't function outside of you. Oh, yeah, he'll just show up and do what he wants. How's that going to work? He's a spirit. Yeah, do things happen, but not that often. Does that door open every Pentecost? Yeah, the last two. I think kind of reminds us, hey, I'm in you, and you take me where we go, and I want to work through you. This is a partnership. Like I said, it's not a reward system. It's a relationship. We get to do it together. Verse 44 says, then it says, I'll return to the house I moved out of. The demon recognizes you as its home. I'm going to move out of the house I was in. It's my house. No, devil, ain't your house. I'll move out of the house, and so it goes back, only to find the house vacant, warm, and ready to move back in. So obviously it got evicted, but how did it get back in? I don't know about you, but when we left the house this morning, we locked the windows and doors. There's no unwelcome intruder going to get in the house while we're gone. In fact, I'm the one with the key. How'd the devil get back in? Person didn't lock the door. Left the same avenue of entrance still open. Why? Because it's probably saying, that eh, ain't as bad as I used to be. Sure, I ain't had that beer in like four months now. What the heck? I'll just have one. Yeah, we're having pizza and beer goes. I remember what that tastes like. Yeah, let's just have one. No, you left the door open. You're feeding the defilement. It says, ready to move back in. Verse 46, so it goes looking for seven other demons, more evil than itself. And they all enter together to live there. Now, not only is he there, he brought seven buddies with him. Why? Mimicking and imitating the seven spirits of God. Man, they are perverted and wicked. And the person's condition is worse than it was it in the beginning. This describes what will also happen to the people of this evil generation. So the Lord gave a twofer in that illustration. So it's been my experience that for far too many believers like to play in the area of defilement. In fact, they even like to fight over and argue and justify their behavior. They don't seem to grasp the concept that it is the Holy Spirit that gets to determine the behavior we ought to be participating in. He will guide us into all truth. That involves much more than just enlightening us to what the scripture says. He guides us on a daily in our walk in the what's and how's of life. Let me just give you these last two verses and then we'll wrap it up. Because I've talked about these a lot before. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says, you don't belong to yourself anymore. This is Passion Translation. Don't you know you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. How many times are we going to say that? Yeah, but I want. There is no what you want. You don't exist. You're dead in Christ. If you're not dead in Christ, you're going to have big problems. Not only that, Leviticus 18, 24 to 29, you check it out. It says, do not defile yourself in any of these ways. For the people I am driving out before you have defiled themselves in these ways. God says, look at these people are doing this and I'm driving them out of the land. When you take over the land that I'm giving you, don't you dare do that stuff. Same thing's going to happen to you. Don't you be doing that. 
He says, you must obey all the decrees and regulations. You must not commit any of these detestable sins. And then our takeaway in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 in the Passion says this, For you know that your lives were ransomed once and for all from the empty and futile way of life. Do you understand this life is empty and futile and we think so much about this life and we get so wrapped up in this life and it's empty and futile? It says, it was not ransomed with a payment of silver or gold, which eventually perishes, but with the precious blood of Christ, who is, who, like a spotless, unblemished lamb, was sacrificed for us. As Paul said, I give all thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through the Lord. There's a way out. The question now becomes, do you want it? You're willing to do what it takes to get it. Because that's where always the rub is. Five little things I just wrote here to end up. First one is this. You've got to admit you're miserable. You know what's interesting? People know you're miserable. You're trying to put on a face. And no, we know you're miserable. And guess what? You're making us miserable too. You just don't think you are. But you are. Because we know you're miserable, but you don't think you're miserable and won't admit to being miserable. So admit you're miserable. Then repent. Repent to God. Tell the unwanted intruder to leave. Lock the door when it goes and never feed on that defilement again. I can't stop drinking. No. Now, that might not be for you. Again, this is a personal thing. But I find it interesting in Scripture, there's never one good thing that happens around drinking. In fact, go, always go to the place of first use. First time you see it. I think it had to do with Noah and his sons. That wasn't good. Really not good. Scripture's not real clear, but the evidence probably arises. The first homosexual act on the earth happened right there because of drunkenness. Not good. So no, I can't drink. But in full disclosure, I bought a bottle of wine last night. Know why? I'm going to stop pouring it out. Because when Jeff was here and he was pouring that out, that really triggered me. Lord, how do we actually demonstrate your blood? Could we get grape juice? Yeah, I've done that, but it's like, no. I'm going to do that. I get that revelation. So I bought one last night. And no, it was weird. I didn't feel wiggy putting it in the cart and going through the store. In fact, I wanted to bring some today and pour it out before we started, but that'll happen. I've got to find me a container to put it in. But see, now no one can say, oh, I saw Pastor Jim yesterday. He had a bottle of wine in his cart. <laughs> no, sorry, ratted myself out. What are you going to say? No, you'll find out what that bottle of wine's going to do. Because his blood's going to flow and cover. You should plead the blood over the property and over my property and over people. No. The blood. Symbolic of the blood. But see, we've got to quit feeding the defilement. Stop justifying it. You know there's certain things you can't do. Am I going to tell you you can't have a glass of wine over lunch today? No. Know why? You ain't my business. You're God's business. I didn't die for you. Just like I'm not your business. And you can't guilt me into making me your business. And I say that with love because we have to get the right mindset because if we become everyone else's business or they become our business, then all of a sudden Jesus is no longer our business. They fill up that place. No, I have to go to God and say, God, 
How does this work? God, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to say today? Who do you want me to engage with today? It's not like all of a sudden we walk out of here in a couple minutes and it's like, okay, my spiritual duty's done. Now I go do whatever I want the rest of the day. You take the Spirit of God wherever you go. And whatever He wants to do, we need to be open to that. And He's not, a, he's not adverse to you doing what you want to do. He just wants to go with you and do it too. So take Him along and have fun with Him. Engage him in what you're doing today. I told you when I went out metal detecting, I engaged the angels and they were laughing at me. Well, we think it's funny just watching you randy around looking for stuff. Because remember I told them, hey, you know where these things are. Start directing. No, we get a kick out of watching you just wander around. Well, I'm not here to entertain you. <laughs> <laughs> so come on, let's go and find something together. <laughs> let's do this together. We need to have that mindset when we get up in the morning. Hey, God, let's do this day together. Let's kick out some demons. Let's get rid of this defilement. If there's stuff I got to quit doing, tell me what it is. If there's stuff I got to start doing, tell me what it is. Let's do it together and walk this thing out. So when we get the end of the road, our relationship's so tight, you're going to say, come on, son. We had a blast down there. I want to continue it for all eternity. I don't want to say, depart from me. I never knew you because you just did your own thing. You thought showing up at church once a week, you know, we were good buds. Nah, I never knew you. Don't ever let it get to that place. Develop your relationship with him. So, Father, thank you. Lord, I thank you that you just kind of put up with us, really. I thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that you want to have that relationship with us, a strong relationship with us, not this surface thing, not this acquaintance thing, but a deep, intimate relationship is what you say in your word. So, Father, I pray today We've gotten some divine revelation. We have ears to hear what the Spirit had to say to each one of us today that we can go and do business later on. That you'll guide and direct. Show us what you want us to do. That we'll just take you with us. We'll partner with you through the rest of the day, the rest of the day's activities. Lord, we love you, praise you, worship you, honor you. And as we go from this place, continue to minister to us in a real way that we are radically changed and transformed into the image of your dear Son. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your day. Be blessed. And as always, you need prayer.